Coming up on the show today, we have all the action from rounds three and four of the Ground Tracks Northern Off-Road Championship. And it all starts with a trip to Forest Lodge in Scotland. Let's go with that action then, and onto the first half of the event. It will be the early lead for Anthony Jackson and Lauren Widdop. An overshoot on the opening stage and a broken alternator were the only issues. And a small lead of 13 seconds was theirs at this stage. For Willie Stubbs, it will be second in both the class and overall places. The times were close at the top though, and it was still very much anyone's event this weekend. Richard Copsey takes the early lead in Class F, just over a minute back from the leading pair, but holding his own in that third place overall. Colin Stevenson makes a good start to the event to lead the way in Class E from fifth place on the overall leaderboard, just over a minute back from West. Problems on the fourth run of the day would lose Robert Simonite some time, around a minute and a half in fact, but he remains in sixth place for now, not too far off a push on day two. Ashley Short and Steve Armand have a good start to the event with seventh place. They also take the early lead in Class C with a significant advantage. It was a good start too for Stuart Heaney, leading the way in Class B at this stage and lying in eighth place overall. Paul Ainsley lies just inside our top 10 overall, taking second in Class E. The times were close, just two seconds back from Heaney ahead. And rounding out the top 10 was Tony Ray, second in class B for now, but he was being chased down in that position. It would be this man, Alistair Morton, doing the chasing. Third in class B now, and 34 seconds back from Ray, ready for a push on day two. For Matthew Elvin, it will be 12th place and third in Class E as well. A minute's gap ahead and a good gap behind meant his place was looking fairly secure for now. David Bros would lead the way in Class D for now. The times at the top of the class were close, leading the way there by 12 seconds. And closest to Bros in the class and overall results was Andrew Miller-Very, second in the class and 14th on the leaderboard with those 12 seconds to find on day two. The gap to third in the class would be a little bigger. James Lofthouse taking that position, 
he wouldn't catch the leading crews, but that third place looked safe, at least for now. Sadly, a good start for Carl Goodchen would be ruined with problems on run five. For now, it would be 17th overall and third in class F. Without the problems, he could have been fighting for a podium place. And with Ashley Short way ahead in class C, it would be up to John Rennie to take up second in the class and 18th overall. For Billy Cruikshank, it would be a little way back again with third in the class, down in 24th on the overall leaderboard. So midway through the event and the results at the top here at Forest Lodge in Scotland look like this. On to the second half of the event then, and there will be no change to third place in Class C for Billy Cruikshank, who rounds out the results in 22nd overall. For Mark Kaisley, it will be third place in Class G, a maximum run early in the event not helping his overall times. Sadly for David Bros, the lead in Class D would be lost. He ends the event with third place in the class and 17th overall. No change with second in the class though, as James Lofthouse remains in that position to the finish of the event, taking 16th overall. Sean Wilkinson, meanwhile, had suffered a maximum on the second run of day one, putting him down the results and out of contention. But a good comeback sees him at least gain third in Class F by the finish after the loss of Carl Goodgen. No change to the Class C battle as John Rennie remains second in that class, taking 14th overall at the end of the weekend. And Christopher Sainter makes a move the right way of the results in the second half of the event to take third in Class B by the finish, as well as a good 12th place on the overall leaderboard. Brian Farmer was another to suffer a maximum on day one, putting him right down the results. He ends the event in the end with 11th overall, second in Class F. It was a good result though this weekend for Andrew Milaveri. He finishes with the Class D victory, also rounding out the top 10 by the end of the event. No change in the class for Tony Ray, second in Class B this weekend, but he does manage to move up the overall results into ninth. It's a good result as well for Alistair Morton, jumping right up the class positions to take that Class B victory at the end of the event. And for Paul Ainsley, it will be third place in Class E. Sadly, a position lost in these runs, but still a good finish to the event with seventh place overall. Ashley Short and Steve Armand, meanwhile, have a good run, avoiding punctures all weekend. The only issue for the pair would have been a broken drive shaft on the start of day two, but they managed to take the Class C victory and sixth place overall. Matthew Elvin has a good run through the second half of the event to move right up the results and end the event with fifth place, taking second in Class E as well. He'd be beaten though to that class by Colin Stevenson taking the Class E victory and finishing just outside our podium places in fourth. For Robert Simonite then, it had been a good day and a good finish at the end of it despite his run full time. It may not have been much of a difference in terms of the overall result though. Third place overall was his at the end of the event. For Richard Copsey, it would be second. A good finish for him and of course taking victory in Class F as well. But this weekend, it would all be about this man. It's the win for Anthony Jackson. His first victory in the car and a result that increases his lead at the top of the championship standings after three rounds. So at the end of round three, the results at the top looked like this. Great result. Uh, 
loved it, loved every minute of it. We had some issues early on in the first couple of runs. I got lost at a quarry and uh, the alternator belt came off, but uh, we fixed it all and we've done well. So, yeah, very pleased. So, good. Yeah, haven't done so bad really. I mean, um, start off it were a few good runs and then it started wetting up a bit. There were some good lines when it started to dry up. Um, good little car really, had the Kevlar wall tyres on so we didn't even have one puncher this weekend which were brilliant because a lot of people suffered a lot of punctures. Um, today, again, it's gone okay, we've just been playing a bit of catch up to get back up to second place. Willie Stubbs unfortunately broke um, his diff. So that, that allowed us to slide into second, or else that we would have been third, I think. Uh, good, I think we've had four or five punctures and did six miles on one puncture. I think I actually came, did get a finish at last event, um, but I did break down, but you need to do 75% of your runs, and I think I've done more than that. So I still have got some points for that event. Um, but and Jackson's going to take some beating, that's for sure. So we just have to see how it goes for the rest of the year. We're back to Yorkshire for round four of the championship, heading back to Bradford and to Hunsworth. And it would be much the same as they'd left off for Anthony Jackson and Nicky Brook. They take the lead by just five seconds at the end of the first day. A small problem with the radiator fan on the first run lost them a little time, but everything seemed to be okay for now. It would be up to this man, Brian Farmer, to try and take the lead from Jackson this time out. Second place for now, and a gap of only five seconds, of course, to try and catch on day two. After the problems last time out, it would be a better day for Sean Wilkinson here at round four, lying third at this stage in the event, 33 seconds back from Farmer. Simon Adams makes a good start to the day to lead the way in class two. The times were good, and with 28 seconds of a gap to Wilkinson ahead. The times for Adams would be close though, with Carl Goodgen close behind in fifth. There was only four seconds between them at this stage in the event too. The fight was on. For Ian Gregg, it would be sixth. He lies second in class two at this stage, losing a few seconds of run to the class leader. So day two, he would have to try and find a little extra pace if he wanted that class victory. After his podium place last time out, it will be seventh to start the day here at round four for Robert Simonite. The first of the day's run times didn't reflect his pace very well, but after that, the times were there and the pace was, and he was close to the leaders. Luke Sagar makes a good start to the event with the lead in class eight. He lost a small amount of time on run six, but nothing that would change the results for him at this stage. And for Matthew Elvin, it would be the class nine lead. Confidence from the result last time out was high and things were certainly going okay this time out so far. So rounding out the top 10 at this stage was Ben Gill, second in class nine behind Elvin and with 30 seconds of a gap to try and catch the class leader on day two. In the classes outside of the top 10 then, it would be 11th place overall for Mark Kaisley, which sees him take third place in class six for the overnight halt. For Chris Sainter, it would be third in class two. The time to Kaisley ahead was only 11 seconds, and he had a good advantage in that 12th position himself. For Ronnie Hoyle, meanwhile, it would be 13th overall. Some way off catching 12th, but lying third in class nine at this stage himself. And Andrew Robinson would be the only one to make it to the end of day one in class one. So a finish this weekend would see him take victory, though that is still harder than it sounds. This situation would be due to the loss of Ashley Short, retiring on the second run of the day with engine problems in the discovery after lying just a few seconds back from Robinson after the first stage of the day. For Aston and Martin Cox, it will be second in class eight at this stage. They also lie in 16th overall for now. And just behind them would be Paul Wilde, 
third in the class at this stage behind Cox and lying in 17th place, just over a minute further back. For Tim Martin, it will be just himself and the overall results to battle with this weekend. He's the only one running in class four. So midway through the event then, and the results at the top here at Hunsworth so far look like this. We move through to the second half of the event then, and it will be a 19th place finish for Mark Shaw and Richard Copsey. A number of maximums on day one, spoiling what could have been a good result for the pair, but they do take third in class five. For Paul Wilde, it will be third place in class eight at the end of the event. No change in the class from day one, but he does slip down a place overall. Tim Martin, on the other hand, would gain some time, but not in the class. Just himself on that class four list this weekend, so the win there was his. No change in class eight either for Aston and Martin Cox. They finished the event with second in the class, as well as 16th on our overall leaderboard. Andrew Robinson was another with a class all to himself. He takes that class one victory and 14th overall. A final run maximum would mean 12th place for Robert Simonite. He does though still take third in class six, but that wasn't the result he was here to take this weekend. Simon Adams would unfortunately start day two with a maximum, meaning his fourth place was lost and replaced by 11th. Of course, slipping down to third in class two as well. Gary Reed takes advantage of some changes in class six and moves up to take second in that class now, as well as rounding out the top 10 overall. Frustratingly for Sean Wilkinson, the podium he'd been looking at on day one would disappear with a maximum on the final run of the weekend. He'd have to settle for ninth place overall and second in class five. No change in the class for Ronnie Hoyle, as it's still third place in class nine by the finish, but the overall times do change a little with a move up to eighth place. It's a similar story for Chris Sainter, second in class two at the end of the event, but moving up the leaderboard into seventh. For Ben Gill, there will be no change to the class position. Second place in class nine was his. He does move up though to take sixth on the overall results at the end of the event. Luke Sagar has a good weekend, finishing with a well-deserved fifth place overall. And of course, taking the class eight victory in the process. For Matthew Elvin, it will be the class nine victory and going one better than his fifth place overall last time out with fourth this weekend. Carl Gudgeon, meanwhile, puts the retirement of round three behind him, ending the event this weekend on the final step of the podium. A great result and only two seconds off second place. The pace was definitely there. And it would be all change in that second place. Brian Farmer retires towards the start of day two, meaning it would be Ian Gregg taking second at the end of the event. And of course, with it, the class two victory. But for a second time in a row, it would be victory for Anthony Jackson. This man on a roll. He led the event from start to finish and takes the victory by a good margin at the end of the weekend's racing. So we reach the end of round four. The results at the top looking like this. Jackson's victory this weekend just adding to his lead at the top of the championship. So that's all we've got time for in this show. We'll be back with more action from the Ground Tracks Northern Off-Road Championship in November. In the meantime, you can get regular videos and updates on our social media. Thanks for watching Special State.
Two left push over the 